Um, it's kind of an emotional moment for us because we were uh, seed stage investors in applied intuition. And so I've seen Casper and Peter, just the two of them, presenting slides. And to then see this is really an incredible experience. We are, as when I say seed stage investors, we invest 500,000 to maybe a few million dollars at the very ideation stage of a company. And so one of the companies that I worked with that's relevant for this audience is Lyft, where I invested when they were a $5 million valuation, still called Zimride, and then stayed on the board until last year. Uh, so we do see the full uh, journey of a company um, from very start to massive pivots and then to where they end up, um, hopefully through an IPO. Um, one of the things that we invest into, a lot of times we get asked, what is it that you see? And so beyond the founder, what is it that you're looking for? And we have a theory around inflections. And inflections are the external wave that essentially the founder has to ride in order for them to have breakthrough success. You have to have some sort of external power because without that, to be honest, the company is just paddling on their own and there's no way that that power alone can actually propel a company to serious success. And so what do inflections actually look like? Um, we say an inflection, this is a book that my partner Mike Maples wrote, is uh, an event that creates the potential for radical change in how people think, feel, and act. Um, those can actually take many different forms. They can be technical in nature. They could be regulatory in nature. They can also take the form of societal change. And we've seen many of these over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Um, some of the most powerful changes can actually be societal in nature. But once every generation or so, and I've seen maybe three of these in my lifetime, you have actually something that's a super, uh, super powered inflection. These we call sea changes. Um, the ones that I've seen in my life are three in nature. And the first one I will call mass compute looks small, but in reality at the time it seemed huge. Um, this mass compute uh, started for me when I was eight years old and my dad brought home an IBM PC Junior. And I remember seeing this and then seeing some Apple IIEs in our classroom. Some of you look like you're of the age where you would have seen those as well. Um, and I remember just marveling at the access to software that we had. Um, in that time, you got to not only play games, but you, you actually had word processors and spreadsheets emerge, and ultimately things even like accounting software that you could access through this computer. The next one was really, you know, mass connectivity. And when I describe the pre-mass connectivity world to my students at Stanford, sometimes they look at me like I'm an ancient dinosaur, right? So you might remember in the pre-mass connectivity world, you, a single family had one landline, maybe if you're really lucky too. Um, you went to the library to research topics and read the encyclopedia about different things. Um, you might have even had a physical Rolodex that had uh, handwritten cards that had information about people's contact information. So mass connectivity really changed this, right? So when you see a sea change and you describe the life before, people look at you like you are a dinosaur. Mass connectivity included the internet browser. It included broadband penetration. It included the smartphone penetration and even social networks. What did that empower? It empowered connectivity of people to information, people to networks, people to compute, people to people, all over software. And um, it was transformative in nature. And this is sort of the era that I hit as I was graduating college. I think Hamant was describing WAP. That was one of the first things that I encountered in my professional life. But, but this next wave that we see here is mass cognition. And to me, mass cognition is um, truly, truly magical. Uh, we've entered into a world where models seem to possess uh, a broad understanding of various domains. And that seemed almost impossible just a few years ago. Um, they're able to handle just a wide range of tasks. 
uh, when I was getting my PhD at Stanford, we had very brittle models that could do one thing and really one thing well if we were lucky. And now we have a new wave of models that are able to handle so many different types of conditions. That to me is super exciting. What you'll notice though is mass cognition is 60 years in the making. I think at Stanford we just celebrated the 60th anniversary of AI. Um, and so it's not something that's just kind of popped out of nowhere. Um, it's been built upon years and years of really interesting research. But mass cognition as a wave is the democratization of this cognition. And there's some really interesting characteristics that come along with this, this wave. I'm gonna to describe to you a few of those. The first, and this has been alluded to by some of the speakers previously, but one of the most interesting pieces is with the advent of ChatGPT, there is so much social awareness about this very trend, right? And the, the capabilities inherent in here. You have students writing their college applications on ChatGPT. And so you get to 1 million users in five days, you get to 100 million users in three months, this kind of social awareness and acceptance of a technology is really unheard of. Um, almost overnight, consumers, young and old, had heard about this. Um, companies, small and large, executives, even boards, were asking about how this was going to change their businesses. And so from an investor's point of view, the challenge is, especially at the seed stage, how do we invest, where do we invest? And as I mentioned, I'm writing $500,000 to a few million dollars in check size. This is a world very different from the previous VCs that we saw where they have $40 billion under management. Um, and so what we look for really is this kind of social awareness. How are we going to create some really interesting opportunities? Well, another characteristic that we're seeing is that there's massive step changes in intelligence. Um, one of the hardest pieces to appreciate about this, this phenomena is that these, these models' capabilities do not appear in a really predictable pattern. So you can't say, okay, it's going to manifest these changes in the next go around. And so some of the things that we, we would note is that, you know, we see some of these immersion properties that, and we're measuring them and we're trying to predict what's gonna happen. Well, it's been really hard. There's a lot of research now happening on how do you measure the capabilities? How do you measure and therefore predict? There's some opportunities that we see in the research that might allow us to predict better. Um, that said, most people that I talk to seem to believe that there will be a massive step change. We've seen the preschooler, the elementary schooler, the smart high schooler, the college student. So the next step is probably a PhD student. Um, but the, the other piece that makes it really hard is because the properties are so emergent and unpredictable, it's just hard to plan for. In fact, I was at OpenAI last week and some of the product leaders were discussing how for them, it's hard to plan out three to six months in advance. And it makes you wonder, if you're riding on top of this technology, how do you plan for the jumps that you'll see in the future? And that's something certainly that you ought to consider. Uh, certainly for us making investment decisions, what we're trying to do is we're trying to be excited about these changes. If we are worried that these transformations will crush our companies, we are not making investments in this spaces. We need to be independent of this kind of step change in intelligence. We need to ride it as if it is an external wave. But the, the thing that struck me the most when I first started investing into the, this landscape, this new mass cognition landscape, is that the magic of this technology is that we can recognize now that language is actually the API to us. This is how we communicate with one another. It's how we want to communicate with compute. But to date, we know that computer systems have been designed so that you know, we make the machine's life easier. Instead, we're going to be living in a world where the machines actually adapt to us 
and the way we want to communicate. That opens up a huge new possibility as we talk about the democratization of intelligence. What does that provide to everyone? What capabilities does that give to us? The consequence is a fundamentally new relationship between humans and machines. And to date, machines were really looking for that explicit instruction. And now, looking into the future, we believe that these machines will be able to respond in implicit ways. What does that really mean? Well, it's going to try to draw out from us what our intent was and to really optimize for that intent. Right now, when I get into even a Waymo, I have to tell them, here's where I want to go. And if I actually want to make a pit stop at a local coffee shop, I have to tell them exactly where to go, get into the pit stop, come back out, get into the car, give them the next location. But an intelligent system would say, you know, usually in the morning, Anne wants to get some tea, but she doesn't really like Starbucks, and there's another place that's on the way that has a shorter wait and also a capability of giving me exactly the drink that I want, and she'll make it to the meeting on time. That intelligence around our context is something that we hope to see. We're excited about that, um, and we really want to see those capabilities now built in. We would love to have more conversations with founders who really think about the API to humans and how they actually leverage that and build that into the future. Um, new approaches that we're seeing, even within research, around things like direct pre preference optimization allows us to get there. Finally, you know, if I think about AI in the physical world, uh, there's a lot that we really want to see as well. And so this comes back to my life being a board member at Lyft, being really excited about autonomous vehicles. Um, one of the things that we used to say was that this physical environment is actually going to become not just a driver's experience, but a world of hospitality. And this was really driven by one of the co-founders who actually had a degree in hospitality from Cornell. But I believe this now more than ever because the experience and the space that we're going to be sitting in just happens to be one that's on wheels. And so how do you think about that as a business? How do you transform your business in that kind of setting, I think, is really critical. I also think that in the physical world, the implied privacy is going to become increasingly important. This is an area that we're really excited by. With more pervasive machines and sensors everywhere, we're really looking for opportunities to leverage things like differential privacy to make sure that our data remains with us. And then finally, another thought that we've had is that the cycle of um, R&D into actual products is really going to start to shift. We think that the whole R&D process itself will actually be supercharged with things like generative AI and AI. Well, that relationship with product development is going to be, is going to have some tension if that product development timeline is very extended. And so if you have a really fast R&D process now, but a slower product development process, and the world is also changing around you, and consumers are really aware of what the capabilities of technology are, you as a company have to adapt. And when we talk about transformation of corporations, of enterprises, this is where we spend a lot of time. We're trying to envision not just autonomous vehicles, but autonomous enterprises. Where will they go? Not just co-pilots helping individuals, but truly an enterprise that can operate effectively on autopilot in some capacities, not all. These are the areas that we're so excited by, and we believe that there are lots of things that we can do. But I hope if you take anything away from this talk, you realize the tremendous future that we face in front of us. We're so excited by it. Throughout history, we have always created products and services with the limitations of the human mind in mind. And now we're just starting to scratch the surface on unlimited intelligence, the hope for very unquestionable reliability, and also unrelenting stamina in our machines. And that creates a really optimistic future for all of us. And that's what we hope for. So thank you so much for your time.